Welcome to The Hopening, the place where hope is happening, with your hosts Fran Cadron and Marina Teran Manery. For more information about Fran and Marina, or to apply to be a guest on the show, please go to our website, www.hopening.com. The Hopening is for informal purposes only and is based on the research of your hosts, Fran and Marina. They, as well as their guests, are not responsible for any losses, damages, or liabilities that may arise from this podcast, which is not intended to replace any professional medical advice or care by medical professionals you are currently utilizing. Welcome everyone to The Hopening, the place where hope is happening. Myself, Fran, our special guest, and Marina are making this a place where hope is happening. And we are so privileged today for Hopening number 94 to welcome our friend Gaia Gontier. Gaia is a doctor of acupuncture. She's been practicing Asian medicine for 46 years that is hard to believe by looking at you, Gaia. So she grew up in Vienna, traveled to many different places to live and to work, and she chose to settle in Edmonton for many, many years. And that is where I was privileged to meet her. And so, Gaia, welcome to the opening. And what was your journey and how did you get here so that we're all privileged to have you in our province? <laughs> thank you for inviting me and um, thank you for this lovely question. Well, I did have quite a bit of a journey in my life. As you mentioned, I did grow up in Vienna and after university, I went to New York and it was actually in New York where I encountered um, Asian medicine and I studied Shiatsu with uh, Wataru Ohashi, which, who is now very, very, very well known indeed. He's probably one of the most leading Shiatsu um, authorities in the West. And of course, in the 80s, that was, you know, he was still, he wasn't starting out, he was very well known already, but it was really a privilege to study with him. I also lived in um, Big Sur and uh, Carmel for a few years. I lived in Oregon for a few years, briefly in Santa Fe, and also in Maui for 10 years. And 20 years ago, actually pretty exactly 20 years ago is when I came to Edmonton. And yes, Edmonton was such an amazing place for me because it, um, it challenged me in ways that nothing has ever challenged me. And it was a difficult decision to stay here. And I basically followed my intuition with this decision and um, haven't regretted it, even though it's been challenging. But I had the privilege not only to go to school here and finish my degree um, as an acupuncturist, as a doctor of acupuncture, but also I um, had the privilege and still have this privilege of owning a business, a wellness center. And um, this is a wellness center very much based on the principles of um European whole body wellness. So we offer many different kind of um, modalities from massage to Reiki to reflexology to hot stone to acupuncture to tarot readings to homeopathy to facials to, you know, so it's all a very holistic approach, really looking at mind body connection and all based very much on heart. It's so incredible to understand moving from a place where there is a lot of sunshine to a place where there is not as much sunshine. I mean, we, we have a lot of sunshine in Alberta, but we also have extreme cold as we have experienced in the last few days, all three of us. So, I always think of replanting yourself and um, in immigration, in moving from one place to another, it's like taking a mature tree, uproot it, 
and planting it in a completely new place and now expecting it to thrive. So you were mentioning that um, it was very difficult for you to now live in Edmonton, but also that you can see the value and the lessons in that. So I hear Vienna, one of my favorite places on this planet, and I hear Maui, another phenomenal place, and I hear a lot of warm places, and then I hear Edmonton. And yet you can see the jewel, the positive. So tell us more about that. I would love to hear the lessons, the, the how did Edmonton come become really that, that place in your heart? Well, <laughs> it didn't, you know, that's such a good question. I love this question. And let me just find the right way of expressing what really drew me to Edmonton, because it was obviously nothing on the surface, yeah. right? It wasn't the weather. It wasn't <laughs> the architecture. But I had come to Edmonton for a, for a retreat um, with some friends that was 20 some years ago. And I remember coming from Maui and it was so such a difference because Maui is so lush and I was living off grid and I was living right by the ocean. So suddenly it was Edmonton, land bound, no ocean, no water to jump in um, and very, very dry climate. So even though the retreat was lovely, I went back to um, uh, Maui and I was thinking, gosh, I'm so grateful that I'm here. This is so beautiful. And I will never forget the moment of standing on the, at the cliffs and there happened to be a full moon when, when I returned and it was nighttime and the ocean was, was uh, you know, the waves were waving and doing their thing. And there was this beautiful full moon. And I was saying, thank you so much. I love my place. I love my life. And there was this little voice that came and said, you're going to go back to Edmonton. And I'm going, no, 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 I am not going there. This is not my place. However, this little voice didn't stop. It wouldn't leave me alone. And it reminded me of an astrology reading that I had had a few months before that. And in that astrology reading, um, this astrologer, who actually happened to be quite a famous astrologer, um, he had said to me, he said, you know, you have lived so many past lifetimes in monastic um, situations, and you are used to uh, being in monasteries and being secluded and, and, and living this kind of life. Um, but your soul actually needs you to be out in the world. And before you know it, you will be out in the world and you will do business and you will get into this place of business and being in the world and fully stepping into all these things that you've avoided so far. And I couldn't believe it. I wouldn't believe it. I thought there's no way that I'm giving up this living off the grid, jumping in the ocean every day, just absolutely no way. And then I came back from Edmonton and this voice reared its head and said, go back there. And it took me three years of going back and forth, back and forth, back and forth until I finally asked my subconscious one day and I said, you know what? I need to make a choice here. And I know I need to make a choice. Give me a dream that I understand and let me know what it is that I am supposed to be doing here. And the dream was so clear. I woke up in the morning and I knew, I knew I had to come to Edmonton. And it broke my heart. And yet I knew that this is what I needed to do. And like I had said before, it wasn't easy. And, um, but on the other hand, it helped me hone my skills in a way that living off the grid and living the kind of life that I had lived before, you know, and living in a cabin in Big Sur up on top of a hill and, and being in all these different kind of environments, it never gave me that kind of an opportunity. But here I had to step fully into life. Mm -hmm. 
So Gaia, when I first met you, <laughs> uh, you had invited me for coffee and I was like, oh my goodness, she works. She works at Wellness on White. And I was like, oh my goodness, I had gone to Wellness on White uh, before COVID and uh, really enjoyed my massage. Uh, the, the masseuse that worked, masseur, who worked on me, uh, really knew kinesiology well. And uh, I was really grateful because I, I do have lower back issues, but he seemed to really understand physiology and gave me some really good uh, advice. And then four years later, or maybe more, I meet you and I find out that you're the heart of Wellness on White. Um, you, you are the person who created Wellness on White. And um, I, I, I would like to know a little bit about what you called the heart, the heart of your business, that um, it's not just a business, but you deal with the heart. So can you explain that a little bit more too? Well, you know, in Chinese medicine, we have this concept of Shen, and Shen is our spirit. And there isn't really a perfect translation for that in English. But the idea is that behind every human being, there is the spirit Shen that incarnates through the person, and it resides in the heart, and it expresses itself through this person, through all their actions, through how they show up in life. And this particular concept was always something that I felt a lot of affinity with because I realized um, that what was most important through all of this was to stay connected to our heart center, to a heart focused way of being even though this wasn't necessarily practiced everywhere in the world. And as we can see in the chaos all around us, it isn't practiced necessarily everywhere in the world. But I feel now actually there's more and more people waking up to that. Anyway, coming back to Shen, when I decided to open my business, and also that was not an easy decision to make, but I had, you know, as the universe always kind of, exactly supplies you everything that you need really when you look at it um it pointed me into different ways of business of ways of running a business of ways of creating a business that is heart-based meaning that it is all about seeing what is the heart the shen of the business what is and how can we as individuals express that Shen and, uh, and create a sanctuary where people that come, the first thing that they would feel is, I'm taken care of. I am safe in the sanctuary. This is a sanctuary where I can go and let go, however much I am ready to or wanting to let go, but to really create that safe space. And also as far as a business is concerned, not making it necessarily a hierarchy, but to making it an everyone business, meaning everybody is included in decision-making, right? So it's not just me making a decision, but everybody's voice is being considered. Everybody's personality and framework and preferences is being considered. Um, so we have a lot of, you know, meetings and, 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 and different kinds of practices where we share who we are, what makes us tick, and how to create a conscious company culture. We base a lot of the um, practices that we have on the Enneagram. So mm -hmm. after people are with us for a while, they learn about the Enneagram types. We all learn about how to use the Enneagram in business, how to use the Enneagram in our own personal lives, not to necessarily to type ourselves, but to really embrace the gifts that we have and also learn about the red flags. And when you know each other's Enneagram type, for instance, and when you know about the system, it is so incredibly helpful to learn how do I communicate properly with that person so that they hear me? Or 
when somebody shows up in a different way, oh, wow, now they are in a really good space and supporting that. Or, oh, now they're really challenged. How can I show up for them and make them feel safe? So it's a very conscious way of approaching business where it is less about profit, which of course is important because you have to stay in business, right? So that there is a baseline of that, that of course is there. But the real focus is on people and on transformation. And once I realized that a business can be a tool of transformation, then I was all in. That's just so amazing and touching to me and really hitting the spot for me because my my entire belief is that there is this power behind all of us and something I work very hard with my clients is to find their essence, which to me is a little bit bigger um, than their soul. And it's just my interpretation of it. But so this, this really hits home for me. Uh, so the Enneagram, what can you tell me about that? Well, the Enneagram is a, quite an ancient system and it is a system of, and it's, it's a very complex system. So I don't know uh, how well I can describe it in a few sentences, but it is basically, um, it is based on the understanding that after birth, in response to the different challenges that you have, you decide fairly early on in life what are the ways that you can create to connect to your um, perceived separation of universal love. We all, as children, as 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 beings we all are bathed in love right there is no baby that has willpower over this over that you know it's either likes it it doesn't like it but it is basically a bundle of love which is what makes them so incredibly attractive right and then depending on the different encounters that they have, the different challenges that they have, what is being uh, displayed in front of them, they find a way to respond to certain challenges. And, you know, one of the first things that happen after we are born and after we are separated, we also and begin to experience, and this is a perceived separation of universal love. So how do we respond to that? Now, somebody is going to become a, what we call a perfectionist, right? They will always need to be perfect, right? Somebody else might become sort of more like a Peter Pan, the, the player, the gambler, the one that always needs something else to catch their attention. They can juggle 20 different things at one time and they won't necessarily go deep into anything. Then you might have the boss, who is, who cannot show vulnerability, but always needs to be in charge of everything and needs other people to believe that they're in charge. And of course, it's not quite as, I, I'm making it ve sound very like one level. And, I, and these are not caricatures, but these are tendencies that we have. And within these tendencies, there's many, many different layers in which we can express ourselves, right? So there can be somebody who, um, let's say is, and I'm just going to take myself as an example here, right? Who is somebody who can, um, is very good at inspiring people and leading people. But when I can, I'm, when, when I can be under stress, I would hide because I don't feel I have the strength to inspire somebody. And I feel ashamed that I cannot inspire somebody. So I will hide away. Right. And I might go into depression and I might go into addiction even. And, you know, so everybody has their own way. But when I'm in good space, I can shine. And I, yeah, I'm, I'm a two. I'm an okay. Enneagram two. So um, it, it fits me quite well. But uh, <laughs> if you were to tell me and the audience, Marina, um, what, a, what a two is typ typical, typical two, what would you say? 
Well, the two is the general, is the caregiver. They have incredible empathy for everything and everyone. And so they will also have a lot of the times the tendency to say yes, even though they don't necessarily want to say yes, right? Now, when they're in a good space, not only are they the most nurturing people and the most kind and, and, and really can take care of yourselves, but they also, you know, one of the things about the Enneagram, you don't stay within your type. I mean, obviously you have aspects of everything, right? But as a two, you would move to a four. So that means that you would also be incredibly creative, not just nurturing, but also really creative. However, when you are under stress, a two would go to an eight which means they cannot show vulnerability. I'm good, I'm fine, everything is okay. And you can see it's not, right? But that is where they are going, right? So then they will get, they will get bossy, they will get unreasonable, right? Does that so, sound right, Fran? That is absolutely right. <laughs> <laughs> That's why, it, you know, a lot of people think that the teacher is coming out in me when I become bossy and unreasonable, but it's not the teacher. It's just that, that part of me that takes charge and wants to run the show when I'm under stress, because that part of me that thinks, geez, just let me do that comes out. So I, I totally agree with you, Gaia. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's quite fascinating actually the Enneagram, quite fascinating once you actually take a look at it and try to apply it to your own life. Um, at an earlier interview that Maureen and I had with you, you talked about Indigenous people and your connection with Indigenous people, where we are here in Alberta, and uh, um, a revelation that came to you uh, on a day retreat that you had had. Can you talk a little bit about that for us? Well, you know, this was a, and this is a very delicate subject, and uh, I appreciate your courage of stepping into that. Um, because, you know, I have a few friends in the Indigenous community here in Alberta. And I, and as an acupuncturist and as a healthcare worker, I've seen, I've observed certain patterns within them, within their health, right? And I see that one of the biggest tragedies in general seems to be a separation from the earth, a separation from living close to the earth. Because I would say in every indigenous person that I've ever had on my massage table, that earth element was the weakest one. It was like, it was somewhat nearly cut off, nearly like severed. And they were working on um, really recovering that and recouping that. And when I say earth element, then that also means um, digestion on a physical level. And on a mental level, it means, or an emotional level, it means I treasure myself. That feeling of I treasure myself is the center piece of the earth element of having a strong earth element right so recently we were invited on a wellness day and um one of the things that i happened to do on that wellness day for that for the community for the indigenous community is i did tarot readings and i was blown away blown away at the similarity of cards that nearly everybody drew. And because I do a lot of tarot readings and I've been doing that for 45 years, you know, it's not like everybody always draws these cards. It was striking how many people were drawing the same cards after being shuffled and shuffled. And I realized that the trauma of the indigenous population is so deeply seated and it is still happening so strongly and that the responsibility that 
those of us that have not undergone this trauma is so huge to help support that I treasure myself because it's as if somebody, entities, people, education had come and just ripped it out of there. So what I saw was were these incredibly beautiful hearts that just touched me to the core. And it was like nearly two people in that person. One was <clears throat> me, warrior, I am strong. And the other one was a big open wound. And what was also stunning was that apart from the tarot readings, I also did a Qigong class. And before that Qigong class, everybody, everybody had at least one really challenging card that spoke of heartache, that spoke of trauma, that spoke of ruin. After Qigong, and Qigong is very much a self-healing kind of practice, the cards shifted. The cards changed. It was like there was a spark initiated or maybe a connection to Shen. You know, it's too, 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 too soon to, you know, really make a conclusion. I mean, this was one event, but it was striking to see how that little affirmation of self-healing opened a door to something brilliantly beautiful. And there were actually a few readings that were very positive and inspiring. And I was so deeply touched and I was really blown away by that. That sounds absolutely beautiful, Gaia. I have chills listening to you and just feeling that absolute need for groundedness kind of intuitively can resonate with that. Um, especially when it comes to the indigenous people and the respect that they that they really deserve in in all of that. So you mentioned when we met last time that you have an astrologer working for you. So why is astrology so important? I have a little bit of experience with this. I um, traveled to India a year ago with my husband, and we ended up going to two astrologers. And the interesting thing was the similarities in my reading between both of them. Mm. It was very interesting. Well, I love astrology and I, and, and, and I appreciate it even deeper as I get older because I begin to understand that, you know, we tend to see ourselves as this little unit here on earth, right? But as we are also opening ourselves into the quantum world, we are beginning to understand that we and the rest of the universe, we're not separate. And the energetics of the universe and the patterns of the universe influence us. It's like you will feel different if you're in a big empty space that is brightly lit or if you're in a dark closet where everything is like really close, right? Those are two, I mean, obviously those are two extremes, right? But the energy of the different planets, they have an influence on us. And every single one of us um, is kind of has a life lesson that is connected to the movement of these different planets. You know, like if I tell you that, for instance, in the last three, maybe three, four months, nearly every single planet from the Earth perspective went retrograde. That means that things were experienced as very dense, very heavy. It was really difficult to get things done. There were, seemed to be a lot of obstacles. It was, it was difficult sometimes even to be positive. There were a lot of dark stuff that came up. So much struggle everywhere. And now 
things have started to slowly, slowly shift. And we are beginning to, from our perspective, again, from the Earth's perspective, the planets are moving forward. So there is, it's like a new hope, a new opening. And the astrology that, that I have working at Wellness on White, she is so lovely and she looks at the astrological uh, chart through the eyes of Jungian psychology. So there is this deep connection, which probably in the very ancient days, like in, in, the, in, in, in the days of Greek astrology or Egyptian astrology, you know, they wouldn't call it necessarily Jungian astrology, but many of the principles that he talks about, they are, you know, also very much connected to those teaching of the ancients, right? He, he really understood those archetypes. So astrology seen from that perspective is incredibly insightful as to how do you move through this world and what makes you tick and how do you best bring out your talents and fulfill your dharma, fulfill your path in an elegant and graceful way. The idea of the planets all being retrograde and then now the shift happening so that from our perspective, from the earth perspective, it mm -hmm. looks like they're proceeding is quite, um, I think it's important, not just personally, but uh, community wise and actually um, whole earth planet wise that there, and I feel it, and anyone who is a healer feels the difference. And it's not because I'm super whatever sensitive, because I know I'm not, but I know that there's a shift in our belief system about because there's so much going on in the world that people and people are taking a stand. We're taking a stand about injustice. We're taking a stand now about poverty. We're taking a stand about big business versus. And I think that that has been a, a long time coming. But I think that now the small people, the people that maybe make up the majority of the population are saying, let's do things differently because the way it's been being done for the last 30 or 40 years, there's a problem with. And um, I'm really grateful to live at this time because we can look back and see what happened and maybe our place in all of that and look forward and say, this is where we want to be. We want to be a higher vibrating population on this planet uh, because that's really the only way that our planet will uh, exist, that it will come back to become all at a higher vibrating level. Um, so, the 22 workers that you have working for you now, they're all heart-centered. And, you know, you asked me before the show began about my, my shirt. Uh, my, mom, my mom knit this, right? My mom's been gone now for since 2005. Oh, my goodness. So it's almost 20 19, years. Yeah. yeah. But um, it was, it's a thing of love for me when I wear it because... Uh, she died in January, middle of January, cold, bitter. Um, she had cancers. She had cancer. And so um, things that we've talked about today is really hitting me. One of my very best friends is right now with her mom uh, as her mom dies of cancer in a, on a bleak January day. You ended up in Edmonton on a bleak January day. Um, so what do you see for yourself and for your business and um, the collective community of healers going forwards, Gaia? I love this question. Thank you. Because it just really helps me tie a whole bunch of things together. Number one, you know, it was interesting because just the last couple of years, I was like, okay, maybe it's time to sell the business, right? I am... Um, and um, and 
and, and COVID, of course, was very challenging. And I'm super grateful that we survived COVID. Super, super grateful. And, um, you know, we had talked about astrology a little bit. And I just want to hook into that here a little bit. Because in a few days, um, Pluto, who is a planet of a whole generation you know like generation x generation y the hippies the yuppies all of those the millennials all of those are basically a, a generation of 20 years and they are defined if people talk about it or not but they are basically defined by pluto the generational planet moving into a different sign and the last since 2008 when we had the when we had the big banking crisis that was when pluto moved into capricorn and capricorn is all about big business big government big structure big 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 which is exactly what we saw and now we had a few months of that already last year but now pluto is moving into aquarius Pluto, last time Pluto was in Aquarius was 248 years ago. 248 years ago, we had the American Revolution, the French Revolution, the Haitian Revolution, and we had all the freedom wars in all over Europe when they said, no, we do not want to belong to this big empire anymore. We want to do our own thing. So what you said about people saying we, as opposed to them, and we just follow but who are we and how do we create our reality and how do we take care of ourselves and each other and the planet and the animals and the insects and the flowers and that, you know, everything, how do we take care that is going to be in, in the forefront, right? So this is a super exciting year. And also we are moving into the year of the wood dragon. And the wood dragon in Chinese horoscope, right? And the dragon is a mystical, mythical animal. It's like dreaming big. It's like actually believing in magic and doing the impossible, both being able to be underwater as well as flying, as well as spewing fire. I mean, can you believe it, right? As well as defending the treasure. And of course, the treasure from the Chinese perspective is less like a physical treasure. It is more like your essence. Right? So this essence, we are defending our essence. We are going oh, no further than this. And we are going to make something happen, right? And then you have the element of wood. And wood is always about growing like a tree. You go grow deeper into the soil. You grow your roots into the soil, but you also grow and open. So this is the opportunity this year. And with growth, there's always going to be change and oftentimes challenges, right? And moving into this new era, because this era is going to last for 20 years, is going to show us more innovation in technology, um, but it is, and, and, and more innovation in both frequency medicine, energetic medicine. You know what Nikolaus Tesla said a hundred years ago, if you really want to know about healing and you really want to know about technology, think in terms of frequency, energy, and vibration. And so even in our healing professions and in medicine, we will see much more emphasis on those practices because we will begin to understand how incredibly important it is. And as we are also seeing more uh, advances in the outer technology, we will also see advances on the inner technology. You know, outer technology is becoming important, but also the inner technology of meditation and figuring out, well, who is this incredibly complex, somewhat magical and mysterious uh, meat suit that I have that is a technology that most of us do not have a, 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 a user's manual for, right? We don't really, we, we have so, a, a, a sort of superficial understanding and we can pick it all apart, 
but we don't really know what bring what puts it together. We're not so familiar with the spark of the machine. We're very familiar with the different parts of the machine. But now it's time to really become in touch with the spark, with the essence of what makes this machine really tick. And I have the feeling that this is what this next little while is going to be all about. And just today, we had a staff meeting. And that's exactly what we talked about in the staff meeting. And that's exactly what everybody shared. What is it that we are ready to let go of? What are the limiting beliefs that we are ready to let go of to invite a higher consciousness of love? And how does that translate into our daily lives? And how does that translate into our business? Oh wow. goodness, that <laughs> wow is right. I I am so excited by what you just shared, Gaia. I am, um, oh my goodness, it's as if you are 100 percent speaking my language. I Thank hear you. you. <laughs> I feel <laughs> you. <laughs> I am, um, I really take that in. And um, we normally by this time would ask our guest, give us a message of hope, and I think you just did. <laughs> but if I have to ask you, to, um, our show is about hope. What is your ultimate message of hope? <laughs> that we human beings wake up to who we are. That we see ourselves as part of a galactic family that is so much bigger. And that violence becomes impossible and unthinkable as a response to conflict. All about love. All about love. And taking, about love. taking responsibility to taking responsibility for that love. And um, even when it's not easy, just to just keep on, just keep on one step in front of the other. Thank you so much, Gaia, for joining us today. I mean, I, I'm sure Marina and I were both goosebumps in so many of the things that you said. Uh, and we do have time left on this planet to this next 20 years to see the shift. And that's my big dream of hope. My mom didn't get to see that, right? To be part but, of it, man. <laughs> yeah, but you know, the DNA and we're all moving forwards, right, mom? So uh, I'm taking you with me. So thank you for being here, Gaia. Thank you for sharing your wisdom and your hope and your insight and all that beauty that's, um, that's been part of you and you're just, you just radiate with it. So thank you so much. <laughs> You're very welcome. Thank you so much for inviting me. And Gaya, lastly, just before we leave, um, how can our audience get hold of you? Oh, that's a very good question. So um, you can find me at, at Wellness on White. That's the name of my business. And White and is W-H-Y-T-E. Y-T-E, that's correct. So www.wellnessonwhite.com. And there you will also find out about our all the services that we offer and about our team. And then um, on Instagram, you can find me under Dr. Geha, D-R-G-E-H-A. On uh, Facebook, I am Geha Gontier. TikTok, I am not active. I have a few accounts on different, but I'm not really active on them. But most of the time is Instagram and through my website. And Gaia, do you provide online services as well? I do. I do. I actually have quite a few of quite a few clients um, that I support long distance because I have clients in Vienna and in England and in Australia and in uh, Texas and you know in different places that I teach Qigong. Um, you know, because once we understand, you know, Qigong is such a powerful self-healing technique that even without needles, simply through right Qigong, right breathing and diet and thoughts, you know, coming back to that ancient understanding of right intention, right thought, right action can be incredibly healing. So I support people in that way. And I also do tarot readings online. Perfect. Perfect. 
Well, thank you so much. This was an absolute amazing episode. Wonderful guest. Thank you, Gaia. And thank you, Fran, for finding Gaia. Yeah. <laughs> You're very yeah. welcome. Thank you. Bye-bye. Well, thank you for watching, everybody. You know where to subscribe. And we will see you next week with more hope. Bye.